So we are actually going to try these uh, old little ones, being only two years old, on Calico Skies because um, our batteries are currently six years old. Um, we have AGM, which is a pretty good life for an AGM. They're still really healthy, but uh, lithium seems like it'll have a lot of benefits for us. So I was finally able to drill out this bad screw. Um, the whole point of it is trying to get this rod out so that could be inspected. And also, as we're going to furlough, it's had to be removed. Bill is working on some rig upgrades since the mast is down. We had to remove it because a rod had popped when Bill was solo sailing Calico Skies offshore the east coast of the U.S., near Beaufort, North Carolina. I had been crewing on Delos, and in our last episode, we'd all reunited in Annapolis together. Bill was a few days behind because he'd taken the ICW up after the rig failed, and he had to divert course. So I need some more tools to get this rod out. But luckily our friends Ada from the Bahamas are in the same boat yard, so I don't have to keep running to our boat, which is far, far away. So I'm um, just take a little cruise down the boat yard, and uh, yeah, then I'm gonna go try to get this rod out. We've stored the mast at Jabin's boat yard here in Annapolis, and coincidentally, Brandon and Dustin from our COVID crew back in the Ragged Islands are also here doing some boat work on their boat, Ada. There she is. This is a low friction track, so the main comes flying down quickly when we drop it. Our other one was bad, the UV damaged, so we're just gonna swap it out. We'll be sending all 10 rods to the company that made the rod heads for us three and a half years ago, when we replaced the rig right around the time we set off to full-time cruise. They will then inspect them to determine why the rod had failed and ensure that the others are okay. Meanwhile, we've decided to replace the furler while the mast is down, since it's not robust enough to handle the ocean miles we've done, not to mention the ones we plan to do. The new track is inserted. I had to open up the mast so to get in here, but I closed that back up. I lost a bolt though, so I'm gonna have to go find a replacement for this. We've actually found ourselves with quite a bit of boat work to do here in Annapolis, but the big one being a conversion to lithium batteries. We hadn't planned on that, but a serendipitous offer came our way via our good friends, Brian and Kaza of Delos. They've been given new batteries to test out and have generously decided to donate their current ones to a very good cause, Calico Skies. Sweet, man. Thanks. Okay. So we are actually going to try these uh, old little ones, being only two years old, on Calico Skies because um, our batteries are currently six years old. Um, we have AGM, which is a pretty good life for an AGM. They're still really healthy, but uh, lithium seems like it'll have a lot of benefits for us, including being able to run the water maker off the inverter. All right, I'm about to tackle uh, lithium install. Last minute, ran around all day trying to find some cabling. Um, it looks like we could fit six batteries in the bank. Uh, same, no modification, which is pretty sweet. Um, the only complication is trying to get them in and make sure all the charge sources work, which I'm about to go play with. All right, so we're starting to remove the old connections to get these big batteries out. I took a couple pictures of all the wiring, so I'm confident I know where everything goes. And with that, the first battery comes out. All right, one battery's out. It's a beast, so heavy. I think they weigh 160 or 170 pounds a pop, as opposed to those weighing 30 pounds each. And then the second, so the spot is now empty. At least these are so much lighter. 30 pounds is much more manageable. We have two of six batteries installed. Pretty ghetto, because we forgot to buy the L terminal. terminal. So you can see we have massive wires coming off. But it's a win, because six fit in there and I gotta clean up the wiring and I gotta parallel them all. But I'd say that's a win. That's uh, effectively 1,200 amp hours of lead acid or 600 of lithium. Pretty sweet. It's the first time motoring um, with the lithium batteries and it's insane how much power they could take. We came in, the bank was only 5% down. So if our AGMs um, running the alternator would be putting in like 20, 30. We're putting in 80 amps right now on a nearly full bank. Working our belt a little bit. I'm actually going to change the belt because we never would be putting as much power in. So boats usually topped off by solar panels. Um, crazy though. Amazing to be able to put that many amps in. Slides. This is always the fun part. Okay. 
it actually wasn't so bad because it's so stretched out. Bill is changing the alternator belt because it can wear faster thanks to the higher charge acceptance rate of lithium batteries. Lithium batteries rely on a BMS, or a battery management system, which lives here at the top. The BMS is a chip that protects the battery's cells for long-term use, and it does this by regulating voltage, temperature, and current discharge levels. Voltage and temperature levels that are too high or too low and current discharge that is too high can damage the batteries. In the event that the BMS will not accept charge because one of these parameters is reached, the alternator could be damaged, so earlier Bill installed this, a circuit protector, to prevent this potential damage. See? It almost went in the right way though. I don't know. It's over. It's close. Mother photo. Oh, It's been out, you know? Yeah, but you got the motion now. So I hope we can remember this. So what I did is I put it on here pre-flipped. Um, we kept flipping it up into there. Let's see if she'll start up and flip the right yeah. way though. Somehow it's getting hotter in here. 91 degrees. Later that night, we're at the apartment we're staying at while here in Annapolis. One of our friends, and patrons, has generously offered it to us while we're working on Calico Skies. It's July now, and super hot, so having AC is a godsend. So we're adding uh, six new batteries instead of the two we had. So I am making- Six new- Lithium. Lithium batteries? Lithium. Brutally used lithium batteries from Telos. Torture tested. <laughs> um, but yeah, I have to make up some but battery in, cables. But in pristine condition. Yeah. Their, their resting voltage was higher than our current AGMs when I put them in yesterday. Okay. Um, so I have to make up some battery cables, which is what I'm doing today, um, to connect all the new batteries. We only have two connections coming from the boat, and we didn't have all these batteries. So I have Brian's crimper here, and I am just measured out 10 inches between the bank that's one. I think theoretically you're supposed to be able to hang off these connections. That's how strong it's supposed to be. Um, so there has, this should be a very tight crimp because it's very important. Mm -hmm. But West Marine didn't have the pre-made battery cable, so I am uh, stuck doing it myself manually. Hurry up, it's time to go. Give it a tug. Uh, okay. From the terminal. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought you were playing with me. Eh. Hold on, I'm trying to film and hold. Tighter. Uh, ow! <laughs> All right, good. <clears throat> All right. So here's heat shrink. Um, that's the wrong color. I can split in half, I don't need all this heat shrink. This basically protects it from water entering the cable. Logan's like, he's up to something, I know it. I know, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Focus, honey. <laughs> this is about to see the juice coming out. Get white adhesive on the on the metal. Mm -mm. It's just coming out there now. Oh yeah. So, one of the things I wanted to change is our um, regulator for our alternator. We have an external regulator on our Walmart alternator. 
This is the old one here, AR5. We're moving to uh, MC614. And one of the nice things it has is it, an external temperature sense for the actual alternator. That's important with lithium batteries because they could take so much juice, um, they could actually overheat and damage the alternator. So you can see I went ahead and installed the new external regulator. It's this blue guy here. Um, it was pretty straightforward wiring. The important thing about this regulator though is that it has an external uh, temperature sensor for the alternator itself. So this wire here is a, I guess a temperature probe and it's actually on the housing of the alternator. And what this will do is it will cut power, it'll cut charging um, in the event that this gets too hot. That's important with lithium batteries because their acceptance rate is so high that this alternator will be maxed out uh, until the batteries are charged fully. So we have to be very careful with the temperature of this guy. So in order to program this, um, they give you the screwdriver with a little magnet and you put it to this uh, red dot right here and that allows you to access the programming mode. See programming. The other nice thing is um, this regulator allows you to control the amount of power that the alternator generates. Um, it's called belt load management. And because the lithium batteries are going to be able to take so much power, I may need to dial down the power that's being put out so that this alternator does not overheat. That's kind of the way they're Besides boat projects, we have found a little bit of time for fun. Our friends Brian and Kaza have been staying in the apartment with us, and our crew here in Annapolis also includes Jeff and Cameron, our friends who own the apartment, and Dustin and Ada from the Ragged Island crew. Because of COVID, we're all we've got, but that's just fine for us. I thought I'd close the loop with you guys on what happened with the rod rigging um, and also give a couple more details on what we did uh, in our lithium conversion. I'll start with the lithium conversion. I would say the number one pitfall that we encountered that we didn't anticipate was our battery charger. Um, the battery charger is a device that takes the generator power or dockside power and charges the battery. It's one of our primary means of charging when solar isn't doing enough. And I would see 80 amps going in, um, but it was triggering at a float of 13.2 when lithium really needs to be at 14.4 to actually charge. The result of this is that we actually had the boat shut down. The BMS shut the boat off, the batteries are all done, and all the lights went out, everything. Um, so just because I saw amps going in, it wasn't at the right voltage, and that's what caused this problem. What I had to do was remove temp compensation, because the BMS already does that on the batteries, and I also had to change the rebulk rate. I think basically what was happening is that because lithiums naturally rest at 13.2, as opposed to 12.7 or 12.8 on uh, AGM batteries, the battery charger thought they were full. So the settings I changed just enabled it to kick in the power and actually charge the batteries. So we have no start battery in our system. We just fit as many uh, lithiums as we could, just because it gives us the most power and it's consistent. Um, but a lot of people maintain a lead acid starter battery. Um, our battery charger does not have the ability to charge when the batteries are shut off. So what we had to actually do is get another battery from Delos and we had to jump our batteries alive. This is like a diesel engine uh, boost pack. So this creates 12 volt DC for dead batteries. So what we would do if we got in a situation where the BMS shut down and we couldn't get it to trigger back on, we would then use this to jump our batteries and then we would be able to use our generator to get the charging back up. The other thing that we wound up having to adjust uh, in hindsight, when I showed you guys the new uh, external regulator for the alternator, the MC614, we had to actually um, dial back the output on the alternator, and this is because the lithium batteries were taking 100% of what the alternator could give uh, for an extended period of times, and we actually did trigger the overheating uh, alarm, and so what happens is it just shuts down all charging. So I, had, I wound up using the little magnet thing I showed you guys, um, and we dialed it back to about 75%, so it's an 80 amp alternator, we're putting in about 60 amps or so. So we have some other exciting projects coming down the line for you guys related to lithium. Um, we actually majorly upgraded our solar setup, um, and the reason we had to do that is because we have to have the ability to generate power to use them. It's useless to have 600 amps of batteries if we can't actually charge them. 
Um, the biggest single theme is that you can use uh, heavy duty AC appliances and draw a lot of power out, but you have to be able to put the power back in, otherwise you're just going to be running a generator all day. So we actually went ahead and added 600 watts more solar. Um, we're actually at about 1100 watts now, and we upgraded all our controllers to Victron. The type of appliances we use off our inverter now are hair dryers, hot water heaters, water maker, all these things draw out hundreds of amps an hour, um, so much larger loads than we'd ever typically use on our battery bank. So I also thought I'd close a loop on what happened to our rigging offshore when I had the failure off Hatteras. Basically what happened is that all 10 of the wires, all 10 of the rods were pulled off the boat and they were returned back to the manufacturer. Um, they cleaned up all the rod heads and inspected them. So for those of you are, that aren't familiar, um, rod heads doesn't use any swage fittings or anything like that. They basically take the rod and they have a die and they compress it down and they make a little mushroom. Uh, that mushroom is what holds and gets locked in the turnbuckles or the masthead fittings. And we had a crack in our forward lower on the port side in that rod head. Um, when they inspected all 10, the only two that had trouble were two forward lowers, and it was actually a manufacturing defect on their end. So when they had the rod head in the clamp, it wasn't clamped perfectly flush or straight or perpendicular, and they, uh, I guess, it was a little bit off, and that caused cracking in two of the 10 wires. That's pretty rare. Pretty rare. They said, like, <laughs> I was talking to one of the riggers, and they are saying, you know, unfortunately, these things are not built to, like, spaceship standards, so you might have a one in a thousand failure, but it's not built to one in a million. Um, most people probably wouldn't, and you know, wouldn't have an issue with it, it's all the miles we've done. You know, we've we've crossed a couple oceans. This rig's done about 30,000 miles. So, you know, the average boat sitting on Chesapeake Bay probably isn't going to have an issue with that little bit of a manufacturing defect. For us, the way we sail really hard and sail really far can cause a problem. So they did check all the other 10 wires and they gave us a warranty letter. So it's basically like starting fresh, which is really good. A little more details on the roller furling. So we had actually replaced roller furling on this boat before. We did it back in 2009, so that was 11 years ago. Um, and the reason we had to replace it again, which is kind of a bummer when you replace one major system and have to do it again, is the one that we had purchased originally was not built for heavy offshore use. So we had to go and upgrade to something more appropriate for what we we're doing. Uh, if you have any questions or comments on that, leave it below and we'll get back to you. Have a good one, guys. That's how we do it here on Calico Skies. Took the whole cabinet to trim right out of the locker. Classic. Yeah, this is German engineered by my friend Jurg in New York. I may have overdone it.